week. He's exactly the same. Every day since the Savior came. Praise the Lord. Blessed holy name. All the day long I sing the story. Praising him for his wondrous love. Praise the Lord, blessed holy name. Surely I know a home is waiting, beautiful home in heaven above. Praise the Lord, blessed holy name. Praise the Lord, blessed holy name. Every day since the Savior came, praise the Lord, blessed holy name. Probably the star of hope is shining, making my path with brighter grow. Praise the Lord. Blessed holy name, never a thought of sad repining. Jesus is with me, this I know. Praise the Lord, blessed holy name. Praise the Lord, blessed holy name. All the way. Every day, there was a young the Savior came. Praise the Lord. Let's sing that chorus one more time. A cappella. Let's sing that chorus one more time. A cappella. Go, go ahead, girls. I've never been Praise the Lord. Blessed holy name, all the way, he's exactly the same, every day since the Savior came, praise the Lord, blessed holy That sounded awesome. Praise the Lord. Let's get a song book out tonight. Let's turn over to page number 138. Let's see nothing but the blood. Page 138. Alrighty, on the first. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other bounds I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part on this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus for my cleansing this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow. No other bounds I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thought of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other pounds I know. 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow. No other clouds I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All right, you can be seated this evening. Very good. Very good. Connor said that was awesome. Amen. Good to be back in the Lord's house. Amen, church. And thank the Lord for uh, the service we had this morning. Thank you for being faithful again. And thank the Lord for a good time of business together. A uh, couple things that I want to announce. Don't forget, Family and Friends Day, August the 28th. We're going to go visiting this Tuesday at 530. I hope you'll come if you can and get in on that. I know a lot of you have things to do on Saturday, so we wanted to add a day there on Tuesday. And, and again, if you say, I can't come Tuesday or either Saturday, but I need to go, Brother Caleb, come see me. Let me know. And we'll get together and go on a different day. But um, we want to get out there. And we want to invite folk to church, amen, and try to be a witness to them. I thought a lot about that. It's crazy how throughout the years you have so many that uh, you knock their door, they come, and they kind of fall away and things of that nature. Uh, we need to get back out there and be faithful to uh, uh, going into the highways and hedges. Amen, church? So uh, please come, be a part of that, and that'll be uh, Tuesday at 5.30, Saturday at 10, and then next Saturday at 10. And now this Saturday on the 20th, we're going to have a cookout and a time of fellowship at our house. Um, and uh, it says 6 p.m. I just feel bad about that time. What do you think? Yeah, you're right. Home and I gotta get food yeah. Ready. All right. But I mean, they can come over while I'm doing that. I don't mind. Y'all enjoy watching me get the video editor that can do That's more. good, man. Good not supposed to talk to me this and way in front I'm, of the church, Heather. I was agreeing with I know, I'm just kidding. Being supportive. I said I was supposed to be yeah, you're doing great, too. Um, essentially, you know, that's, that's our mindset. But if anybody wants to come early and help and be with us, you're more than welcome. I just don't want it to be so so late. That's all I'm trying to say. But just hang out. That's right. Essentially, it's going to be all day. Is what we're saying. Just you know, come stay with. Just live with us. Move in. No. Um, but uh, please bring sides and drinks, and we'll have a good time. Okay. Um, but I hope you will come. I do. I hope that you'll come be with us as we have a cookout. It would be so sad if it was like, like just us and Tyler, you know. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? So it's a normal Thursday. <laughs> and Connor. Well, I don't know. Connor's acting like he may not come. Oh, oh. You gonna be there or not? You still undecided? <laughs> see, see what I told y'all. O'Connor, bless his heart. But uh, please come be with us Saturday. Uh, ladies' Bible study is canceled this week, and uh, I've got a couple of meetings, and I, I mentioned this this morning. So, the Macedonia tent meeting is the fifth uh, through the ninth. They've asked me to come preach Monday, the fifth. So, would love to have. Uh, all of you there that, that's able and would like to come, just let me know. I'll give you some coordinates and we can head that way together, Lord willing. Also, New Water's having a tent revival. And the tent meeting that they're having, I, I reached out to my dad today about it. It's, it's Monday through Thursday. Um, and uh, they're, they're having it on the grounds. And it's a, it's a commemorative meeting for Beulah Land. So, uh, Beulah Land Baptist Campground, where New Water meets, 
started by a tent meeting. Uh, they used to put a tent up there and have church, and it led into this campground and building of the pavilion and all of that. And so I reckon they're doing their tent meeting to honor that and would love to have you there. Uh, I'll be preaching, Lord willing, Thursday, from what I understand. Uh, but uh, that's September the 29th through August the 1st. August, August 29th through September 1st. <sighs> Thank you, Heather. Um, you're the best. So uh, I hope you'll pray about that and make plans for that, okay? I believe that's all the meetings that I've got planned. All right, praise the Lord. Anything else I need to announce at this time? All right, if not, uh, let's talk about prayer requests uh, this evening. I mentioned uh, Brother Norman. Miss Sandra, they're doing good, uh, doing real good. And so, but let's pray for them. They've been dealing with sickness. Uh, and, and we also mentioned uh, Ricky Shirley. Let's pray for him. Somebody else with a prayer request before we pray. Just remember my job is a Yes. Okay, let's pray for Brother Tyler. Brother Zach's texting me in case y'all's wondering. I forgot a meeting to announce. <laughs> Amen. Um, the men's meeting. I talked to a couple of the men on Wednesday night. Uh, brother, talked to Brother Wes here, a handful of others. Uh, New Water hosts a men's meeting. I think you went, Brother Joe, sat last year. Those dates, let me get those for you. Those dates are October 20th, 21st, and 22nd. And uh, going to have Brother Tim Shirley and Brother Tony Shirley, Brother Andrew Decker, uh, Brother Josh England, Brother Noah Broughton's preaching, and um, Brother Curtis, and I think... Paul asked me to preach on Friday or Saturday. I can't remember, but I'm supposed to preach sometime or another in it. Again, that'll be October the 20th through the 22nd. And the way they do that is a Thursday night, Friday morning, and Friday night. And Saturday morning and Saturday night. Did I say Thursday morning? Okay, it's not Thursday morning. Thursday night, Friday morning, Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night services. Um so if you can be a part of that, that'd be great, men. And we'll do more announcements and try to make plans for everybody that would like to be a part of it. I want you to be there if you can. Uh, it's really good. All right. Somebody else with a prayer request before we pray. Miss Angel. Amen. Let's remember this. Pray for Miss Angela. Job situation there. You still at Walmart or no? I'm trying to get away from Walmart. Okay. I hate to just put you on the spot and ask you, but I was kind of curious what you got going on there. That's good. Let's pray for Miss Angela. Amen, church. Amen. Lord would open a door Amen. that she could get away from Walmart and be happier. Whatever the Lord's will is there. And as she mentioned, let's remember her family. Spiritually speaking, somebody else, Miss Marlene. Wednesday. Let's remember, let's remember Trent going in Wednesday for a colonoscopy. Let's pray that that comes back okay. And uh, pray for his mind. She said he's worried. Let's pray, Lord, give him peace about that. Okay, church, remember him. Somebody else? Prayer requests before we pray. All 
All right. Well, uh, let's do this. I think this will be right in order. We want to pray for our young people. School starts Wednesday. Uh, and they're excited about going back to school. No, you're not excited? No, my parents are. Did you hear Miss Debbie? Amen. Hallelujah. Um, let's remember these young people that's going to public school. Amen, church? And pray the Lord help them. They can be a light and an example uh, in, this, in this school. All right. Well, I think it'd be all right if we prayed around them too. You think it'd be all right, church? Oh, yeah. It's a big deal. I know we downplay it, but walking into that school is a big deal. And so we'll pray for these prayer requests, but uh, if you're going to public school, I want you to come forward and uh, gathering around the altar. And uh, if you're going to high school, middle school, elementary school, come on up, kiddos. Um, and we're going to pray for you because it's hard. Going into those schools is tough. This is good. This is good. Church, let's gather in around them and let's go Lord in prayer together. Brother Beckham, if you could, play softly. And let's ask the Lord to touch them and help them. Uh, as they go back, we want to we lift them up in prayer tonight. Make a point to do that. So uh, y'all pray for them. Pray that the Lord give them Pray that the Lord give them some wisdom and some strength and some courage as they go to school. Ask the Lord just to bless them. Bless them, bless them. Uh, it's not an easy thing. Not everybody can be homeschooled. Not everybody can go to a Christian school. Let's lift these up that's going to the public school and ask the Lord to give them, give them courage that the decisions they've made throughout the year at the camps and such would stick and they'd be something for the cause of Christ. Let's remember them. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for these young people, God. Lord, I pray you'd help them and Lord, watch over them as they go back to school. Lord, I pray you'd give them strength and, and Lord, I pray you'd give them courage. Lord, it's not an easy thing to go into these schools and so Lord, I, I pray you'd You'd help them in this, Lord. I know many of them's been to youth rally and teen camp and youth services, youth functions throughout the year. And Lord, decisions have been made. Lord, I pray you'd give them the courage to, Lord, keep their decisions, keep their vows, God, uh, that they might, Lord, be what you'd have them to be uh, in that school system. Lord, I pray you'd, you'd help them to be alive, help them to be salt, Lord, and to go in there with courage. And with confidence, Lord, in you and, Lord, in your word, trust in you and you alone. And, Lord, I pray you'd help them that they might be a witness, Lord. It sure would be good if some of our young people, Lord, would get a burden for lost souls that they go to school with, God. And that you'd help them as they try to live for you there in those schools. Bless them, help them, touch them, and watch over them, God, as you see fit. Lord, I pray you'd be with our uh, church family that's not here. Be with Brother Norman and others that have been sick. Ricky, pray you'd touch them and help them. Be with Brother Tyler and Miss Angela with their job situations. Lord, we pray you give them wisdom there. And Lord, be with Miss Angela's family that's not in church and not saved. Lord, we pray you'd help them. Be with Trent and his colonoscopy appointment that is on Wednesday. We pray you touch his mind as well. And Lord, touch this service tonight. We want to enjoy your presence. We want to, Lord, be, be mindful of you. We want to mind the Holy Spirit of God and be found faithful in everything that we do. We love you, Lord. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. I pray. Help us, God. Let's have the choir sing tonight. Let's have these young people come sing a while.
out in my day. God's mercy was with me all the way. His goodness stayed close by to meet all my needs. My Lord is taking good care of me. I'm never forsaken, i never
that he died on the cross and was willing to give his life for us sinners and deserving of nothing and I'm glad he did it willingly will there be somebody with a word on your heart something you want to say or do at this time anything else amen, amen. Yeah. anybody else with a word on your heart tonight all right go. Okay. Praise the Lord. Grab your Bibles. Turn to Acts chapter 8. I'm going to change gears a little bit tonight. I heard somebody say once that it's okay to ever so often get away from what you've been doing. And uh, I have felt the need to do something like this for quite some time. And uh, Brother Zach, you got that video queued up? Okay. Um. I want to show y'all a quick video. I think it'll be funny to you. But the reason I want to show this to you is going to kind of segue, or when you see this, it's going to segue us into the reason I want to uh, deal with what I'm going to deal with tonight. And uh, But this is a funny video that me and Brother Zach quote often. Thank you. As soon as I said that, these boys are like, this is a fact, because... We do. We quote this often. It's ridiculous. And when you see it, you're going to agree that it's ridiculous. Go ahead and hit play, Brother Zach. Nehemiah was willing to back things up. He was a man of action. God's Word doesn't tell us if he was right or wrong in his reaction in, in, in this, but it does show that he was vindicated. He was full of the zeal of the Lord. They had so profaned God's house, he had to send a message. You know what? As leaders here, this new policy is going to be instituted here at Bible Baptist Church. Okay? I'm going to say this, though. There might be times where that happens. There was a young man in Calvary. Uh, his name was Ben. And I was running a youth group. I was there for a few years. And um, he was just, he was a nice kid. He was one of those kids that was always just, he's a real smart aleck. He was, just, was, was a bright kid. Which didn't help things, right? Made it more dangerous. And we were outside one day, youth group, and uh, he was just just trying to push my buttons, and he was just, you know, kind of not taking the Lord serious. And I walked over to him, and I went, bam! I punched him in the chest as hard as I, I crumpled the kid. I just crumpled him, and I said, I leaned over and I said, Ben, when are you going to stop playing games with God? 
I led that man to the Lord right there. <laughs> There's times that that might be needed. That's enough, Brother Zach. Go ahead and shut him down. That's never needed. Somebody say amen. So me and Brother Zach have, have really enjoyed this video. Uh, you know, punching kids in the chest. Crumpled him, he said. Led that boy to the Lord right there. These are, these are lines that we've quoted and quoted and quoted. And uh, that's not necessary, okay? Brother Zach likes to say, how is that man not in jail for abuse? And we just don't know. Maybe, I don't know. But anyway, so what has spurred uh, tonight's message is the idea of leading someone to the Lord. You don't have to punch them in the chest as hard as you can. Amen. He said, Ben, when are you going to stop playing games with God? Amen. That's a quote that we've wore out. But uh, again, the reason I want to bring this message tonight, the reason I showed you this video is the topic of, here it is, leading someone to the Lord. Now, before I get into it again, Acts chapter 8, if you're not there already, get to Acts chapter 8. I'm not tonight going to deal with, um, I'm not going to deal with soul winning. That's not the purpose of tonight's message. Now, I believe in going out. I believe in trying to influence people with the gospel. I definitely believe in uh, telling people about Jesus Christ, and we're going to get into that. But I'm not going to talk tonight about walking up to somebody's doorway, striking up a conversation, and trying to influence them into making a profession of faith. I'm not real big on that. I'm not real big on that. It's You're trying to sow the seed, water the seed, germinate the seed, grow into a plant, and bear fruit right there. And what the Bible teaches is the Bible teaches, Paul gives the illustration and, and makes the statement. He said, he said, I planted. He said, Apollos watered it. So that's a transfer of, I went to this individual, I sowed seed, the individual moved along, and, and Apollos, another good godly influencer in the Bible, he began to pour water, what is water? The water of God's Word. began to preach to this person, teach them God's truths. And what happened? The Bible said God gave the increase. God's the one that ultimately brought the individual into faith and into practice as a believer. Now, can, now the question is, well, cannot somebody uh, get the seed sown and, and have it preached to them and be watered and God save them? Yes. Yes. But it's not something that we can orchestrate or work up. And I'm afraid sometimes in our movement, the Independent Fundamental Baptist movement, Okay, a lot of men are trying to do that. And there's been a lot of men build massive uh, churches and it, it's bothersome, um, some of the things you've heard. That being said, we do want to be conscientious and understanding on how to lead somebody to the Lord. Tonight, what I'm dealing with, church, is you... And I, we need to be on the same page. And we need to be, we need to understand when someone's on the altar, we need to have enough understanding of saying, all right, I can go up there, I can take my Bible, and I can help this person come to an understanding of salvation and guide them, lead them to the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying, church family? Say amen if you do. And before I get into it, I want to make a couple statements. Uh, one statement I want to make is this. Don't ever tell somebody to ask Jesus to come into their heart. Amen. Now that's a cliche statement that a lot of Baptist churches and a lot of people love to say that. It's just not one time found in the Bible. That's not biblical salvation. Okay? And so I, <laughs> that's something I want to make clear. Something else I want to make clear. We believe in a, an experience of salvation. A moment. That's when I got saved. You ought to be able, and the Bible backs this up, you ought to be able to profess when God saved you. And if you can't, I question your salvation. 
I bring your salvation to task. You say, Brother Shirley, how can you do that? Because of the Scriptures. You want to know what Paul would do? He'd say, on the road to Damascus. You know what he was doing? He was testifying about when God changed his whole life. Amen. And he, he was professing the moment. He was professing the moment. And we're going to get into the fact of professing and, and confessing, scriptural term, of our salvation. That is highly scriptural. You must be able to confess that you've got saved. And you can't confess it if you say, well, I can't tell you when, where. I can't exactly tell you a moment. That's a sorry confession. Amen. Amen, church. Am I right? That's like saying, you know, I promise, I promise you, uh, you know, I, 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 was, I was born in America, but I can't give you a date, I can't give you a document, I can't give you anything to prove that. Well, I question the legitimacy of your, your birth in America. Amen? Right? Those are legal things. Same thing goes with your birth into the family of God. There needs to be a moment that you can go back to in your mind, and you may not be able to tell, you can't tell the time on your watch. You can't, some say, I can't even tell you the date. I just know about how old I was. I know I was at this church. I can't tell you the message, but I know when God saved me. When I come to an understanding that I was saved, you need to have that. Amen. That's important for salvation. Say amen if you're agreeing with me. Amen. Amen. Well, one of the things that's got this message on me was a couple of instances where people have come to the altar seeking to be saved and, and people have professed, you know, I, I'm not comfortable trying to lead somebody to salvation. And let me just tell you something, there ain't nothing to be ashamed of. As a matter of fact, I commend those that have professed that. Um, I don't, I don't want to embarrass Brother Connor, but can I use you in an example, Brother Connor? You sure? So, y'all heard me talk about one side of the spectrum of where they're running up and down the roads, knocking on doors, and trying to influence somebody to make a profession of faith right there. All right, that's one side of the spectrum. We don't agree with that. Amen. That's just... The other side of the spectrum is, all right, you can't talk to somebody while they're trying to get saved. You can't, you can't communicate with them. All right, they have to figure it out on their own. And what we have is we have young people that are saying, how do you know when you're saved? And we've got adults that'll say, oh, you'll know when you get it. That's mysticism. That's like something from Disney World. And what we and I've seen it, boy, I've had close relatives live to be 20, 25, 30, 35 years old and can't get on salvation, Brother Joe, because they're seeking something because this is all they've been told. You'll know when you figure it out. That's not the Bible either. So that's, that's, the wrong, that's one side of the spectrum. And the other side of the spectrum is, is if you'll read this, pray it, you're saved. Telling them they're saved. That's too far the other way. So we got to try to figure out, all right, how are we in the middle? So tonight, this is my goal. My goal is that everybody that's here has a better, has, has, has some confidence in the ability to take somebody that's ready to get saved. You understand? This is somebody that's maybe at the altar. This is maybe some, like your children, for instance, or a loved one that says, I need to get saved. I'm lost and I just need to get saved. You ought to be able to take your Bible and show them, are you listening to me? Show them how to get saved and not call me. Now, by all means, you can always call me. I'm not saying, don't you dare call me about this. I'm just saying, you shouldn't have to. Amen, church? This is something you shouldn't have to call the preacher about. We should, every single believer, have the ability to say, now this is how you get saved. This is how you, you come to an understanding of salvation. Are we on the same page? I want to train our church tonight on somebody that's ready to get saved, primed and ready, know they're lost and ready to get saved, leading that person to the Lord, okay? I'm not trying to teach you how to influence somebody to get to that point. I'm just trying to teach you tonight how to lead somebody to the Lord. Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, look at verse 26. 
The Bible is our authority for all things. It would be foolish for me to tell you how to lead somebody to the Lord and never go to the Scriptures. This must be the answer. So, what we have here in Acts chapter 8, verse 26, the Bible says, The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, uh, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge over all her treasure, uh, and had come to Jerusalem uh, for to worship, okay, was returning, and sitting uh, in his chariot, read Esaias, the prophet, that is, of course, Isaiah, then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither uh, to him and heard him read the prophet Esaias and, saith un and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man guide or should, should guide me? There's that word guide. I wanted to point that out. The topic tonight is leading somebody to the Lord. All right? And for the crowd that says it's wrong to lead somebody to the Lord, wouldn't you agree with me that to guide is to lead? Okay. All right. He says, how can I? Again, uh, there in verse, let's see, where was I? Verse uh, 31. Verse 30, he says, Understandest thou, verse 31, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and... Who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? And then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Now, you know, briefly, he was reading Isaiah 53. All right, Isaiah 53. Verse 36, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Are you all with me? If you're with me, say amen. amen. We're not in la-la land. We've got an Ethiopian eunuch, a man of renown, a man with authority and a man with power, a man that had an appreciation for the God of Israel, but did not understand Isaiah 53. And briefly, there's a reason Isaiah 53 is the forbidden passages of the Jew because it points right to Jesus. Amen. He's reading Isaiah 53. The Bible said he went to Jerusalem for what? To worship. Well, what, what type of worship was he participating in? Jewish worship. Okay? And while studying the Scriptures that the Jews claim, Amen, comes to Isaiah 53 and he's reading these passages and can't come to grips with who is this man? This is describing a specific man and I can't figure out who it is. God is influencing Philip to be there to tell him and literally the Spirit of God has led him to this Ethiopian eunuch and in this conversation with this Ethiopian eunuch, Philip preaches Jesus to this man and now he's ready to be baptized. Obviously in this message, baptism was discussed. Amen, church? Amen. We believe in baptism. And here you find a clear understanding of what true baptism is. Uh, verse 37, Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. He went down into the water. Why? Because baptism is by immersion. 
And baptism is for adults after their salvation. All those doctrines are simply found right here. Mind you, verse 37 is not found in the NIV. If you've got an NIV tonight that's not in there. And that's, why, that's, one, that's one reason why we're King James only. And if you read the context, verse 37 is really important. Right? That's salvation. And so, here we have an example, a really good example in the Scriptures of a Gentile, now you and I, Gentile, not Jewish descendant, of a Gentile professing faith and being baptized based off of that profession of faith. If you're with me, say amen. Okay. First off, I want you to notice briefly that this, this exchange was scripturally orchestrated. That's vitally important. We see the sinner in verse 27. We see in verse 29 the Spirit of God. And we see in verse 30 the Scripture of God. Here in verse 30, this man is reading Esaias, Isaiah. He's reading what? The Bible. This book is supernatural. Please Please, if you haven't at this point, you really need to build an appreciation for the life of God's Word. It's wonderful. I can't wait. I, I, there's, there's, there's a testimony if God will let it come into fruition. There's really a good testimony that I want, I want to be able to share with this church based off of, of a believer that's come into something in the Scripture that I mean was like a head-on collision with God. I mean like you know, crumpled somebody, amen. Uh, but no, but like somebody, and God's going to have to do some things, and I believe He's going to. Why? Because I believe that book. Amen. It's a supernatural book. It's unlike anything you've ever read. And if you'll read it, God will open your eyes up to some things and really just birth some wonderful experiences with you through the Scriptures by the Holy Spirit of God. So the Scriptures orchestrated this, 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 this position of this Ethiopian eunuch. Amen, church? He's at a place, he's primed, he's ready, he's been broken down by the Word of God and brought to a place of, of, of wanting to know what God has to say for him through the scriptures. That's a wonderful place to start. And, and, and so we see the scripture, that this was scripturally orchestrated. We see that because it was scripturally orchestrated, that there was a sermon that was facilitated. The Bible says, Philip, of course, being led by the Spirit, uh, he goes unto this Ethiopian. And the Bible says that this Ethiopian's reading uh, Isaiah, there in verse 30. He asks him, Understandest thou what thou readest? And what does the Ethiopian say? How can I accept some man should guide me? And then the Bible tells us that Philip, rather he desired Philip, that he would come up and sit with him, and uh, tells us where the scripture was. And there in verse 34, the eunuch said, uh, I pray thee, of whom speaketh this? And, and the Bible says in verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth, and what does he do? He began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Now, let me pause for a minute here. I believe, and I believe it's not a question, uh, the scripture teaches us about the calling uh, of a preacher. But if you study your Bible, you know what you're going to find out? You're going to find out how that to give someone the gospel is, is a type and a form of preaching. And it doesn't have to be behind a pulpit. And it doesn't have to be inside of a church sanctuary. And you don't have to be called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now there's some men that would just fall slap out with me about that. But make no bone or problem about this. Anybody and everybody should be participating in delivering the gospel. And you can't give the gospel without it being preachy, if you will. Now, you <laughs> that mean you got a hack. It doesn't mean you got to have a shirt and a tie. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? Here's a man one on one with another man, and he's given him the gospel. And the Bible calls it preaching. Why? Because that's what it was. And you don't have to be a pastor or a God-called man to give the gospel 
by preaching it, if you will, to somebody. Again, there's people that would just slap fall out with me about that, and that's just going to have to be okay. I'm not talking about a position inside of a church house as a preacher. I'm talking about giving somebody the gospel. And so what does Philip do? The Bible says he preached to him Jesus by connecting him to Isaiah 53. He was bruised for our transgressions. Y'all know the passage of Scripture that he's referencing. And so this was sermon facilitated. Because of the Scripture, it brought out a sermon for this man, and it was all about Jesus. You say, well, what all did he tell him about Jesus? We don't know for certain, but isn't there a lot to say? I, if I had to guess, I'd say he, he, he professed to him and preached to him that he was the true Messiah. Wouldn't you agree? Here's a eunuch that just went to Jerusalem to worship the God who's supposed to be sending a Messiah. Surely he preached to him, well, this man here, Jesus, he's the guy you just went up there looking forward to coming one day as the Messiah. He most likely revealed to him his virgin birth. He most likely revealed to him that he was pure and perfect without sin, that he had miraculous power, that he was miraculously powerful, that he walked around this world healing every single manner of sickness and disease and ailment that was uh, possible. Uh, he most likely revealed to him, of course, that he came, that he suffered an immense full suffering, and that he died uh, and was buried and spent three days and three nights in the grave and resurrected on that third day. Surely, surely, if he preached to him Jesus, that's what was delivered unto him. Amen, church? This isn't anything profound. It said he preached to him Jesus. And I believe in, in this he most likely referred to the fact that Jesus was uh, the satisfaction and satisfied the price for man's sin and was the supplier for man of everlasting righteousness and to justify men to God. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying these things most likely was delivered unto him. Now that Jesus now sits on the right hand of God and ever liveth to make intercession for us. And in this exchange, most likely in some capacity, preached to him uh, some doctrine around the, 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 the idea of baptism. You say, well, how do you think that? Why would you think that? Because that's the first question that this eunuch asks Philip. The Bible says Philip preached to him Jesus there in verse 35. And then in verse 36, during this conversation and exchange, they pass by water. And when they pass by water, eunuch says, right, here's some water, Philip. How about I get baptized? What's, what's hindering me? What, why can't I? Why couldn't I go down there and you baptize me, Philip? And so in this exchange, preaching of Jesus, he maybe in some capacity preached to him the truth and doctrine of how that John the Baptist came preaching a water baptism as a type and picture of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that would take place by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we participate in baptism. Amen. It's a scriptural thing. It's us identifying ourselves with what Jesus did to us in our salvation, being baptized by the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's a public demonstration of a personal possession and experience of salvation. That's why we get baptized. Baptism doesn't save a man. Amen. Baptism will not save you. If you've never been born again and you get baptized, that don't save you. Amen. Salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. Paul gave God thanks that he hadn't baptized some folk. Would he do that if it's what saves us? He wouldn't thank God he didn't baptize somebody if the baptism saved them. No, baptism doesn't save you. But baptism is important for the believer. So here's this, this eunuch, and he says, Philip, what doth hinder me? I, I, I need to get baptized. And Philip makes a simple question. There in verse 37, or rather a simple statement, he says, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, we see this sermon that was facilitated, and then we see this sinner that debated. He asked a question. And the question was, 
what doth hinder me from being baptized? Flip to Romans chapter 10. Flip with me to Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> what doth hinder me from being baptized? What did Philip say? He said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And then there was a public profession to Philip by the eunuch, and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In other words, he was professing his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Romans chapter 10. We're in Romans on Wednesday night. It's awesome. I love it. I hope y'all are enjoying it. Romans 9, 10, 11 is to who, church? Those of you that are here on Wednesdays. Romans 9, 10, 11. Who's that to? The Jews. And what Paul's doing is he's honing in on those Jews and he's making them aware of their need to believe in Jesus. Look at verse 1 of chapter 10. This is going to be a little bit of a prequel lesson because we're not there yet on Wednesday. But Paul said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So what's he saying here in chapter 10? I want y'all to get born again. Amen? For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. What he's saying is he's saying they're trusting their own righteousness. They think they're good enough. They're in verse 3, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. In order to get saved, in order to achieve that righteousness, what do you do? You believe, well, in who? In, in Jesus. Verse 5, For Moses describeth the righteous which is of the law, that the man which doth uh, those things shall live by uh, them. But the righteous which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or, who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again. From the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, notice, the word of faith which we preach. Verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call upon or on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. It says, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. That's a reference of Isaiah 52. Right before Isaiah 53. All this is connected, church. Paul in Romans tells us, I would that the Jews got saved. And he said, and herein is how you get saved. And he said, and it ain't no different for a Jew or a Greek. We all need the same salvation, and it's a whosoever will salvation. Amen, church? Amen. That's what Paul's saying. And what Philip was doing was he was demonstrating for us that a public confession of a personal reception of Jesus is sufficient for baptism. Now, we're talking about getting saved. Amen, church? We're talking about leading somebody to the Lord. I made little cards. We'll work on passing them out. 
I have had the pleasure of trying and, and helping multiple people um, at the altar or sitting in a chair uh, get born again. And uh, the main thing is that they know what they're doing and why they need to do it. You understand? I've had the pleasure of having multiple young people come to me that wasn't ready. You say, how do you know? I asked them a simple question. Why are you here? What do you want? Well, I want to get saved. Okay, that's good. Why do you want to get saved? And that is my determining factor as to whether or not I'm going to take the Scriptures and lead them to the Lord. If the person says, well, my sister got saved, so I thought it'd be good, I'd like to get saved too. I'm going to say, well, praise the Lord, I'm glad your sister's saved. You keep coming, you, keep, you stay faithful, God will help you to come to terms, God will reveal it to you, and it'll work out in time. Amen, church? They don't know what they're talking about, and there's a key truth that must happen before somebody can get saved, and that is, number one, recognizing their sinful estate. If you don't know that you're a sinner and going to bust tail wide open if you die, you're wasting your time. You can't, you can't save somebody ain't lost. You've got to get lost first. Well, I've had a lot of that. A lot of young people come to me. I almost got it right. You need one, Zach? I got two left. You're getting one, baby. Me and you. Look at this. I didn't even count, son. I couldn't have planned it if I tried. Hallelujah. This is just a quick little sheet of paper I typed up at the house. Heather read it. If there's a typo, it's her fault. Amen. Um, <laughs> You stick this in your Bible, have it on hand. But let's say Connor here is lost and he comes to the altar. And it's a Wednesday night on Super Church and he's a bus kid. Because let me tell you something, that's like the harvest is white right now, prime for the picking. Those Super Church services, the last Wednesday of the month, is like they're ready. And it's just been good. And we've been seeing souls get saved in those services. So let's say here's Connor. And he's been sitting through the month of, of when is Easter? April. And, and Brother Zach's been preaching about Easter all month. And we got the last Wednesday. And Connor, man, he's wanting, like, like that eunuch, he's wanting whatever that is. He wants in on it, son. And he comes to Super Church. And I get up here and I preach salvation. And it's right. And we have an invitation and Connor goes to the altar. And praise the Lord, I'm up here and I'm trying to orchestrate service and I don't really have the ability to get with him at that moment. And so because I can't get with him, Brother Joe sees him. And I see Brother Joe and we kind of do the whole head nod. And Brother Joe gets down there with him and takes his Bible. The first thing is he, he's going to ask Connor, is he's going to say, what are you doing up here? This is my approach. What are you doing up here? And let's say Connor's like, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. I just... And he's like, did you come up here to get saved, boy? And Brother Connor, son, he's, he's ripe for the picking. Yes. Yes, I come up here because I need to get saved. And Brother Joe then needs to say, well, why do you want to get saved? And again, church, this is everything. Because I've had multiple kids say, well, my sister did. Well, I think it's probably a good thing. Well, <laughs> sounds cool. I've got this one girl, she's, got, she's kind of cross-eyed. I don't remember her name, kinky hair. Olivia, macaroni, chicken, uh, chicken nuggets and mac and cheese. Amen, that's my girl. And she come up one day and didn't have a clue. She's like... <laughs> We're, what is this? You know? And it's like, you're so precious. Just 
I love you. You did good. Thank you for coming up here. I do everything I can to not shame her. I have no desire to shame them. Side note, I know personally people that got shamed. My papa has told a testimony multiple times about being in a tent meeting and having a man go to the altar and having preachers get down there with him and look at him. And one preacher made this statement. He said to the other preacher, he said, I don't think he looks like this is real to him. What about you? The other preacher said, no, I don't either. And they sent him back to his pew. That's wicked. If that boy dies and goes to hell, there will be recompense. I don't know. God help. That's, that's wicked. We have no desire to shame them. But I ushered that young lady back. She had no idea what she was doing. She just went up there because me and her is friends and I'm up here and she just wanted to come see me, really. And that was what it was. But now Connor, he's broke. He may have tears, he may not, but he's broke. He's worked up. He wants to get saved. Brother Joe says, why do you want to get saved, boy? And Connor says this, well, I don't want to go to hell. That's a cause for salvation. Can I get a witness? Amen. Brother Joe, first thing you need to do is you need to say this. Well, why would you go to hell? What's the reason? Point number one, recognizing their sinful estate. Why does people go to hell, Connor? And Connor's going to say, well, because of sin. Or he may say, well, I don't know. So let's say Connor says, well, I don't know. I just know that I've not been saved and, and if I don't get saved, I'll go to hell. Joe says, well, that's good. Let me tell you why if you die without salvation, you'll go to hell. And he, he reads for him Romans 3.23. Why, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. And that death right there in Romans 6.23 is the eternal fire damnation of hell. Amen. That's, that's the eternal death. Amen. Y'all understand? And so here's Connor. And guess what Connor now understands? I'm a sinner. Maybe he says, well, okay, but I don't know that I'm a sinner. I didn't put this in here, Joe. But what you do is you go to you go to the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20. You don't need to necessarily go over there. Most of you, I'm sure, knows the Ten Commandments. Who can tell me a Ten Commandment? Adriana, can you tell me one of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not steal. <laughs> Proud of you. Carla? No, no, that's not a Ten Commandment, but that's okay. Good try. It's okay. What do you got? Thou shalt not kill. The one you were talking about is not to bear false witness. That's good. That's good. What about you, Aiden? Thou shalt not commit adultery. So let's say Connor says, All right, well, am I a sinner? Joe, I'm going to say, Thou shalt not steal. You ever stole anything? Thou shalt not bear false witness. You ever told a lie? And they're going to say, Well, yeah. If you've ever done it once, you're a sinner. And so here's Connor, and Connor knows I'm a sinner. And because I'm a sinner, I'll die and go to hell unless I get saved. All right, how do I get saved? So Joe has revealed to Connor he's a sinner. He's ready. He knows he needs to be saved. Joe is now going to say, now would you like to know how the Bible tells us we can be saved? Of course, Connor's going to say, yeah, I want to know. I need to be saved. I need to go to heaven. I've never been saved. Joe's going to go to number two and three. Repent for your sinful estate through belief in Christ as your personal Savior. So this is another thing I want to point out. I'm try really trying not to be complicated, but I, I want to point some things out because we're Bible believers. Amen, church? Big topic about repentance. Some people like to think that, why, if you just go to confessing your sins, that, that God will save you. That's not repentance. They love to go, quote, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's not talking about salvation. 
If, it was de- if, if my salvation was dependent upon me confessing every sin I've ever done, I'm going to go to hell. <laughs> because I can't remember them all. Am I right? <laughs> Not to mention, I've committed some I probably ain't even aware of. No, repentance is not the confessing of your sins. Repentance is the turning away from you and your sin and going and receiving the Lord in faith. People love to talk about, is repentance a part of salvation? Why, Lord, yeah. Your repentance is simultaneous with your faith. You can't believe without having turned away from you and what you are. That's like what faith in the gospel is. And so, Connor says, well, how do I get saved? What Joe's going to do is Joe's going to then instruct him to believe in Jesus Christ. And the best place for that's Romans 10. Romans 10, 10. Romans 10, 9 and 10. I can't tell you how many times I flipped my Bible to Romans 10, 9 and 10 and read those two verses to a lost person and that was enough. Why? Because that book's alive. 9, 10 and 11. Well, some like to read that 13th verse and that's good. But 9 and 10 is typically all you need. And essentially it's this. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, Joe looks at Connor and he says, Connor, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you put your faith in His death, burial, and resurrection, the Bible says you're saved. Now, Joe did not say, now you believe that, so you're saved. You can't save them. You've got to be careful now. If you put your faith in the Lord Jesus and believe on Him, thou shalt be saved. And so, Connor then will bow his head and spend some time praying. Now, let's just take a moment here. Are we okay? I know it's late. Y'all are getting sleep on me, but bear with me. Did the Ethiopian eunuch pray? Now, as far as we know, he didn't. He looked at Philip and he said, here's some water. What hinders me from getting down there and getting baptized? Philip said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt. He said, I believe that He is the Son of God. And guess what Philip did? He took Him down there and dunked Him. Let me tell you something. Prayer is a work. And prayer don't save you. These men that would just murder me for this. But I'm right in the Bible. But the Bible said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's right. So why do we practice praying in that moment of salvation? Calling on the name of the Lord will help you in your faith. You understand? And it's about that name. That's the, that's the agent of salvation. Jesus. And so Joe looks at Connor and he says, Now, Connor, you pray, and I'm going to pray. But now my prayer can't save you. So what you're going to do is you're going to have to talk to God and put your faith in Him for salvation. And guess what? The ball is now in Connor's court. And I'm typically going to spend some time praying, and I'm going to get quiet. A lot of times, I don't even give an emphatic amen. I just pray for a minute, and then I just kind of dwindle out to nothing, and I wait. Why? Because I don't want them to think I'm saving them. This is just me. I'm just telling y'all me. And I give them all the time they need. And I wait till they're done. And when they're done, I say, have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? 
What's real important is what they do next. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made. Have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes. If you died right now, where would you go? Heaven. All right, let's tell the world. That is the proper way, I believe scripturally speaking, on how to lead somebody to the Lord. How many of y'all feel better about it? Be honest. So the other day, I wish she was here, but she's not. Miss Harmony, Super Church. Brother Zach preached, talked about salvation. And I sat with Harmony and dealt with her shortly after she first got here. Her and Seth. Seth's an independent Baptist. He found our church. He started bringing his kids. He comes to me after service. He says, Harmony's wanting to get saved. I want you to lead her to the Lord, brother. I'm like, all right, let's go talk. That boy right there just resurrected. Look at him. Did y'all see him? I'm talking about, we just saw a miracle, son. Anyway. And Harmony was very small and really, really wanted to get saved. And I told this to the church the other day. She made a profession that day, but it was very immature. Me and Seth knew it, and it was like, look, brother, you just keep bringing her to church. God will work this out. She's not sure about everything. She's little. I don't know, six, seven, eight years old at the time. She was very young. Well, now the other day, Super Church, Brother Zach's preaching. And she come to terms with that she thought that I saved her. And that's what she told Gabby. She said, Gabby, don't somebody have to save you? And Gabby's like, what are you talking about? That's a pretty good Gabby impression, wasn't it? What are you talking about? She said, like, doesn't the preacher have to save you? Don't you have to have a preacher or someone save you? And Gabby's like, no. And the light bulb goes off on Gabby, and Gabby's like, this girl thinks Brother Caleb saved her. And Harmony's like, I think Brother Caleb saved me. She'll die and go to hell if I have anything to do with her salvation. I can't save nobody. Amen. Even when we lead them to the Lord, we're not saving them. And so Gabby come into my office and we talked. Gabby and Harmony. And we talked. And Harmony came to terms and she looked at me and she said, I am not saved. I said, all right, girl. I said, you want to get this thing knelt down right now? Get her figured out? She said, yes. She already has had her sin preached. She already knew what she was dealing with. I said, well, you just need to put your faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Now, I'm going to let you pray and you talk to God about it. I said, but now, I'm going to pray. We're all going to pray. But this between you and God, we can't save you. And she knelt down and she prayed till she was done. And when she sat up, did you put your faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone? Yes, I did. I said, you believe you're saved? She said, yes, I do. If you died right now, where would you go? I'd go to heaven. Now, sometimes you're going to get a curveball. And sometimes you're going to get down there to lead somebody to the Lord and they're going to make things real hard and they're not going to get settled. That don't mean you failed them. And you need, listen to me now, you need to build some confidence by, by attempting. Are you with me? How many of y'all with me? By attempting. By being willing to say, I'm scared to death of this. I don't know if I can do it. But I'm going to talk to them. And let me encourage you to do something for me. Come on Wednesdays for Super Church. There was one Wednesday, we had so many young men up here that two or three did. It needs to be one-on-one. -on -one. I've watched where people take 15 kids and they say, now if y'all repeat this prayer, you're saved. If you repeated it, raise your hand. We got 15, just got born again. And it's like, needs to be one-on-one. -on -one. Needs to be one believer 
one unbeliever so that you can help them with no distraction and nobody falls through the cracks. How many of y'all's ever heard the testimony of all oh, my friends went up to get saved, so I went up there with them, and when I got done, they stood me up and said I was saved and filled out a card and baptized me, and I never really had it. Well, how does that happen? Well, they fell through the cracks because it wasn't one-on-one. -on -one. Be here on Wednesday nights. Keep that card in your Bible and be willing to ask me any question between now and then. Say, Brother Shirley, I need to talk to you a little bit more about this. How, so tell me again how you go about it. I'll tell you. We'll take our time. I need your help. Grace Baptist Church ought to be filled with Christians that are able to take somebody to the Scriptures and for them to get saved. I'm going to be honest with you. If you've been saved 5, 10, 15, and 20 years and you don't feel comfortable with that, you, you should be a little convicted about that. I'm just being honest. That should be a little convicting to you. If you don't feel like you could take a Bible and say, this is how you get saved, then you, you, you've been in church your whole life and you've not grown in that. And don't you, wouldn't you agree with me that of all the things a Christian should grow in, it's their ability to influence someone else with the gospel? That's something we're all called to. We're all called to go into the highways and hedges. We've all been instructed with this great commission. And so if you've been saved years and years and years and years, and you're like, man, I don't think I can tell somebody how to get saved. That should be convicting to you. And you need to be taking all of this that I've said real seriously. Because here's the truth. I'm going to be calling on people to help. At this point, everybody that's here for sure, I'm going to be calling on you to help. Again, especially on them Wednesday nights. And what I've done, and I'll be real frank here, is I've failed in the past about calling people that wasn't ready. And that's what I was going to say earlier about Brother Connor. Brother Connor come out of a church that you didn't talk to people about salvation. And I didn't really recognize and realize that. And on one of the first times we had a crew of them come, I called Connor on someone, and you were seen him. Chris, you remember me and you was right there making fun of the boy. It's like, what's he doing? I had no idea. And after service, he comes to me and he's like, Brother Caleb, I've never done that. And I'm like, I'm sorry, man. That was me. I should have known better. I shouldn't have just called you on that. But I, I, I mean, when we've got a crew of kids, church, adults, ladies, men, I need your help. They need your help. Amen? Am I okay? Are we okay? This is so needed. Felt like this was more than needed. And I, I've had multiple confirmations of that. One more time. You got a young lady. She comes to the altar. And she's lost. And she needs to be saved. We use Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Elizabeth comes. She's like on the altar. Everybody knows it's an invitation for salvation. And here's this young lady. And it's Elizabeth. And so Heather sees her. And Heather gets up and she goes down. First thing she says is, What are you doing here? And Elizabeth says, I'm lost. I need to get saved. Heather says, why do you want to get saved for? Elizabeth says, because I don't want to go to hell. It's time to lead them to the Lord. Elizabeth says, well, Gabby got saved, and I just think it sounds great. Oh, that's good. It is good Gabby got saved. You're a blessing. Hey, I'm proud of you. Listen, you just keep coming. Keep listening to the preacher. Everything's going to be fine. I'm going to pray for you. You did a good job coming to the altar. If you ever need to go to the altar, you keep coming to the altar, Elizabeth. I'm so proud of you. Can we pray together? Yeah, let's pray together. All right. Pray together. Send her back to the pew. Amen. But no, Elizabeth says now, I don't want to go to hell. Heather says, all right. Why, do you go to, why would you go to hell, Elizabeth? Well, because I'm lost. Yeah, but what is the reason that you're going to go to hell? Well, I don't know. Elizabeth, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. 
And what that's talking about is that's talking about an eternity in the lake of fire in hell, Elizabeth. So if you die in your sin, you'll go to hell. Elizabeth, are you a sinner? Yeah, I'm a sinner. I've lied. I've, I've been disobedient to my mom and my dad. I'm a sinner. Heather says, okay. Well, the Bible says the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. And what the Bible says in Romans 10 is with the heart man believeth in the righteous and with the mouth confession is made. And so if you'll believe in Jesus Christ and that when He died and was buried and resurrected, that's sufficient for you to be saved. If you'll believe in that and you'll receive Him as your Savior, the Bible says you're saved. Would you like to do that, Elizabeth? Yes, I would. Well, I'm going to pray for you. But now, Elizabeth, I can't save you. I can't save you, Elizabeth. You're going to have to talk to God. So you call upon Jesus and you put your faith in Him. And they bow their heads and they pray. And Elizabeth prays till she's satisfied. She sits up and Heather says, Elizabeth, did you put your faith in the name of Jesus? Did you put your faith in Jesus? Yes, I did. If you died right now, where are you going? I'm going to heaven. Let's tell the church. Now that's real simple. That's cookie cutter, if you will. That's, that's the way we want it to happen. It's not always going to. And you're going to have a hard conversation. But let me help you. That's the direction you want to head. That's the conversation you're trying to cultivate. And look here, you can do it. You can do it. Any of you. But Brother Caleb, wouldn't it be easier just to tell them to ask the Lord Jesus in their heart? Yeah, but I don't believe that saves you. The Bible don't say it does. And listen, we need Christians that are capable and confident in taking a Bible and showing somebody the keys to eternal life. And we don't need people to try and take the keys and throw them out in the middle of the ocean and say, good luck. And we also don't need people to take the keys away from them, stick it in the door and say, look here, you're saved. We need some people to say, here's the key. If you'll do this, put your faith in Him, He'll save you. Faith's not a work. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works. Therefore, faith and grace ain't works, lest any man should boast. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus, He'll save you. How are we doing on that? We good? I hope to God He gives you opportunities. Can I tell you about the first time I ever led somebody to the Lord? His name was J.R. John Ross Kepler. Brother Zach, remember John Ross? Junior, they called him. And the old boy was a mandolin playing machine. He was a dandy. He and his brother, they called him Butch. Can't tell you his real name. Michael, remember, in Britain. It's three boys, and John Ross, was he thought the world of me, and he played the mandolin, and he was high strung and skinny as a rail, just a little boy. And I was a teenager. I announced my call to preach, and I loved him. And everybody knew he was lost. And his daddy got saved out of Catholicism. Can't remember his name. John Kepler. John was a Catholic, got born again. And he was, a, I mean, the real deal. And John Ross got so full of conviction one day, he piled up in the altar. And like I said, he had taken a liking to me, and I thought the world of the boy. So I laid up in there with him, he and his daddy. And his daddy was on the other side, and we was praying. And he prayed a long time. And John Ross sat up and looked at me in just tears. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Soaking wet. He's crying so hard. Ready. Hallelujah. I said, what are you doing? He said, I want to get saved. I said, well, look here, John. John Ross, J.R. I said, it's just as easy as believing in Jesus and Him alone. And I quoted Romans 10.10, 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I said, if you'll believe on Him, He'll save you. And he bowed his head, and he went to praying. I'll never forget. <laughs> I was a praying. 
And he sat up with a big grin. I said, what about it, John Ross? He said, God bless you, Caleb. (laughs) And wrapped his little skinny arms around my neck. I said, did you get saved? He said, I'm saved. I didn't have a thing to do with that salvation. Jesus Christ wrought the whole thing. Amen? And anybody can do that. Anybody can lead somebody to the Lord. I want to encourage you. Maybe you ought to take this and tape it on the fly leaf of your Bible. Whatever you need to do. I walked around, a lot of you has marked it up and wrote things. Do whatever you got to do. Keep you some gospel tracks. Get familiar with scriptural passages of salvation. Our church cards right now, they simply say, recognize your sinful estate, realize the penalty of sin, and receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior. And that third point, receive the Lord Jesus, references 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, which simply says that it's through the gospel that we're saved. And the gospel's the death that Jesus Christ came and died according to the Scriptures, that He was buried according to the Scriptures, and that He resurrected the third day according to the Scriptures. Have those gospel tracks on you. Maybe somebody's just going to look at you and say, I'm going to die and go to hell if somebody don't help me. And you can pull a gospel track out and have it right there. Be familiar with the Bible. Be familiar with what the Scriptures say. This is not the only passage about salvation. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him... When do we get saved? When we believe in Him. And what is salvation? Unto everlasting life. And that everlasting life comes at the moment of faith according to the Scriptures. That was just in case anybody was struggling with eternal security. Amen. Amen. Faith saves you. Get familiar with the Scriptures. Marvel not saying to thee, you must be born again. What's being born again? Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll get to where you can talk to anybody, anywhere, And it don't matter how much they struggle, you can help them get settled on salvation and you ain't got to be a pastor to do it. Are we okay? I know I'm spending a lot of time here, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, Grace Baptist Church adults, Wednesday nights, we're going to have too many come wanting to get settled on salvation and I'm going to need your help. And I'm going to call on you. Brother Beckham, Well, he'll be on the piano most likely. If not, Brother Beckham, can you help this young man? Brother Joe. Miss Debbie, this young lady is lost. Miss Cindy, grab your Bible. Can you help her? I may just call on you even if I've got plenty of help. Listen to me, because as your pastor, you need that. I believe that. I believe it would be real good for well, Brother Shirley, what if God didn't call me to do... Don't, don't you dare. He called every one of us for that. If you've been born again. How was that? Was that alright? Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to hang around for a while after service. you got a question, you come get me. I mean it. You say, what about this? What about this? That's fine. Just ask me. We'll talk. Let's bow our heads together. A little different tonight, Lord. I, I, hope it was, I hope it was effective. I hope people feel more confident. I hope they put together in their hearts and minds, Lord, a plan to help somebody get settled on salvation. Lord, thank You for people that care about it. Thank You for people that want to know more about it. I can't wait to hear about folk that take a young person and lead them through the Bible and get to watch them escape an eternity in hell. What a blessing. What a blessing. Help them, God. 
I pray that each and every person here tonight, Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would be strengthened, that we would be empowered by the gospel to give it and to help others get saved, to lead them, to guide them with the Scripture into an understanding of their salvation.